Thanks for joining us online today. We hope you're blessed by this message. If you have a prayer need today, please visit our website, SiouxFallsFirst.com. In Jesus, amen. If you have your Bibles or devices, go ahead and turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I just want to say a simple prayer. Jesus, we love you and we thank you so much for the opportunity, God, to celebrate life change. Thank you for what you're doing in people's lives in this church, outside this church, what you're doing in our lives through the week. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather together on Sunday and worship you together, this great big family that you've given us. God, thank you for the power that's in your word, even as we declare it now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm not going to preach that long this morning. I'm just going to share a few moments, and then we are going to conclude by celebrating the Lord's Supper together. But we're going to continue our summer series on the book of Nehemiah called Brick by Brick. As we read through this story, the stark reality is that whenever you pursue the vision of God for your life, there will be resistance. We see this in every chapter, even leading up to chapter 6, where Nehemiah's enemies are relentless. Now they are attempting to stop the vision of God and halt God's progress in desperate measures by engaging in intimidation. Sanballat began to spread rumors that Nehemiah and company were planning a coup. They were planning a rebellion to overtake the king and the current administration. Why would he do that? Well, let's read in chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Nehemiah said, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. I want you to remember that verse. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. So we see that the miracle was about to happen. In fact, you want to be here next week because we're going to talk about the completion of the miracle. What happens when we encounter success? What do we need to do when God moves powerfully in our lives? But right before it was accomplished, the enemy did everything within his power to prevent it from happening. So how does the enemy use this facade because even as Nehemiah stated, what you're saying is not even true. How many know that the enemy is the father of all lies and he will constantly speak what is not true? Nehemiah realized that, but how does the enemy use the facade of fear to prevent vision from becoming reality? Vision is a preferred future. Vision is where God wants to take you. Out of what bothers you, out of what disturbs you, the vision that God births in your life is not something that's supposed to be just far away and, and, and in the heavens somewhere. God wants to bring it into reality. But how will the enemy try to prevent vision from becoming reality? First of all, we see that it's a fabrication of the unlikely. Fear is a fabrication that does not measure up to truth. It's a facade that creates a fictitious storyline. That's what Nehemiah's enemies were presenting him to prevent the vision from becoming reality. But let me ask you this morning. Have you ever had obsessive, fearful thoughts of what could possibly happen? What if I lose my job? What if I get that dreaded phone call? How will I handle that? What if I get that terminal disease? What if something happens to my kids or my grandkids? You see, the enemy wants to disturb your peace. 
And the reason he wants to disturb your peace is he wants to stop you in your tracks. He wants to keep you in the house. He wants to keep you fearful. He wants to keep you from movement. He wants to keep you from doing anything for God. He wants you to play it safe. And so that's exactly what he does is he brings fabrication of the unlikely. Ever since 9-11, many people have wrestled with the anxiety of terrorism. Will I ever be a target of that? Will my family ever be affected by that? And if you don't think you think about that, let me take you to the airport. As you walk through security, it's something that comes to your mind. As you get on the airplane and you take your seat, you're looking around, checking things out because it's something on your mind. Whenever you enter into a sports arena or a big event, it's something that crosses your mind. And you see, the enemy has used that to paralyze a lot of people with fear. You see, this happened to me um, the last time I took a missions team to Uganda. We were getting ready to leave. We had an awesome week of ministry. We taught pastors and we saw young people saved and we saw the Spirit of God move and we got in the van to go back to the airport, Entebbe Airport, where we would fly out and come home. And information came to me that there had been a bomb threat on Entebbe Airport. So we pull off the main road and get ready to go up the road to the airport and and, and they, everybody had to pull over. And everybody had to get out of their car and they would check out the car and they, they would make sure everything was okay and then they sent you on to go to the airport. And your fearless leader. Absolutely fearless leader. Got out of the vehicle and led the team. I said, guys, just follow me. Fearless. Got into the airport and began to make our way to the ticket counter. We got to the ticket counter, and I'm leading the way, and I see this really large bag at the front, right in front of the ticket counter. Nobody's around it, nobody's claiming it. I'm asking, hey, whose bag this is, and, 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 and nobody's claiming it, so I begin to tell some of the workers. I said, hey, um, I don't think this is anybody's luggage. Can you take it? And get it out of here! All of a sudden, your fearless leader became a fearful leader as I was leading this team. Well, the good news is, it didn't happen. I don't know what happened to that bag. I don't know where that bag is today, but I know that nothing happened at the airport that day. But as I was preparing for this message, the Lord reminded me of that big bag and how the enemy will often enter seasons of your life, junctures of your life, situations of your life, and he will place a big empty bag wherever he can. And he will use that bag to intimidate you, to incite fear in you, because he wants you to live from a foundation of fear, not a foundation of faith. Because he, he wants, in every decision you make, in every thought you have, in every relationship, on your job, in your school, in our nation, even in election year in 2016. God, God, God wants, wants us not to live in fear, but the enemy wants us to live from a foundation of fear. He wants to keep us from moving. He wants to disturb us. Well, I love this because Nehemiah addresses the fear factor. We can learn a lot from Nehemiah. And here's what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah said, hey, what you are saying is not true. He exposed them. He said, what you are saying is fabricated. It's a lie. It's not the truth. He called them out on their bluff. He said, it's a concocted story. But even after he called them out, the enemy didn't quit that easy. And you need to understand, when you overcome one enemy of fear and you you bust through one obstacle of fear, the enemy is going to come a different direction. Because one of the common weapons the enemy uses against the people of God is fear. 
and he will bring that weapon from whatever direction he can in order to disturb our peace and keep us from progress. Look at verse 10. It says, Nehemiah went to the house of a man by the name of Shemamiah. Shemamiah was an acquaintance who presented himself as a friend to Nehemiah. And here's what he said. Hey, Nehemiah. He said, why don't you and I go to the temple? Go to the house of God and enter in and close the doors and lock them. And basically have this prayer meeting because Nehemiah, there's a bunch of people that want to kill you. And they plan on coming at night when you're sleeping and when you've closed your eyes and they're going to take your life. Now, we find out that Shemamiah was a puppet of the enemy, a puppet of Sanballat. And you, you need to understand that the enemy will use people to promote fear and disturb your peace. Even people you think are friends. Even people that may extend relationship and build relationship with you. That's like somebody coming up to me and saying, Pastor, I want to pray for you because I heard everybody's going to leave the church. Are you with me? Dude, I'm, I'm not going to enter into a prayer meeting. I'm not going to be thinking about prayer. Anxiety and fear is going to rise up with me and I'm going to try to close back doors. Are you with me? I don't know what the context is for your fear of how the enemy wants to incite that in you, but sometimes he will use people and they will even be disguised as people that want to help you out, that want to move you along, that want to promote you in your life. So how do you think Nehemiah felt that night when he slipped into his PJs, he climbed into bed, and he blew out the lamp. How, what do you think was going through his mind? Well, I learned a little bit about Nehemiah, and I know that he knew how to bring down that stronghold. I know he knew how to resist the, the enemy, but most of us in that situation, our mind would be going crazy. Because the enemy will use thoughts, he will use circumstances, and he will even use people to intimidate us. Why? Why does he do that? Because secondly, the enemy wants to bring an incapacitation of the momentum. Momentum is movement. Momentum is forward progress. How many of you realize this morning you cannot stand still spiritually? You are either moving forward or you're moving backwards. You've got to find out where you're at. You've you got to find out if you're slipping or you're moving forward because there's no place for stagnation in the kingdom of God. And the enemy wants to block, he wants to prevent momentum in your life. You see, the very purpose of intimidation is to restrain us from action and to force us into submission. Fear creates a sense of inferiority. And when it's allowed to stay, we will become slave to the intimidator. The enemy uses the facade of fear to control us, to limit us, to keep us from fulfilling the vision of God for our lives. In fact, it literally has potential of squelching the gift of God inside of us to keep it from moving, to keep it from operating to keep us from being fruitful and effective for the kingdom of God. Fear imprisons us. It disheartens us and creates a sense of hopelessness. Now, as we said, this is a very common weapon of the enemy. But in our story, we learn this is the final weapon that Sanballat and Tobiah and all of their cronies use to try to halt the miracle that's just about to take place. If we... Go back to verse 9. Here's the reason. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. This was their last ditch effort to cause Nehemiah and company to throw in the towel, 
to give up, to quit. And the enemy will, in the same way, try to make you quit by making you think that you just can't do it. Making you think that it's too dangerous. Making you think that there is no way that you're going to be able to accomplish that which God has placed in your heart. But it didn't work. I love how Nehemiah saw past the facade. Look what it says in, down in verse 11. He said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? He said, I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him. Let me pause there. You need to know who's speaking to you. You need to know who is showing up at your door and knocking, ringing the doorbell. You need to operate in the spiritual gift of discernment to understand who is speaking, what are they saying, what are they trying to do to my life, what is the, how is the enemy trying to use them to halt what God wants to do through me. Nehemiah recognized that. He said, hey, I know that this is not from God. I know that this person is not from God. I know that that voice is not God's voice speaking through them. But as we read on, it says, he had prophesied against me. Because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. So the puppet of Sanballat and Tobiah, this guy that re revealed himself as a friend, that said, hey, let's go to the house of God, was actually one the enemy had sent and it says he had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this and they would give me a bad name to discredit me. You see, Nehemiah had a mandate from God to rebuild the walls, restore the city. And he said, I am not going to allow fear to keep me from obedience and doing what God's called me to do. Because he said it would be sin. Do you know why? Because God's not the one that said that to him. God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. That's how God wants us to operate. He doesn't want us to operate in fear. So even today, I feel the Holy Spirit is speaking to some of you that you have been living from a foundation of fear, anxiety. And some of you have tried to find help in other things. Some of you tried to find relief from this anxiety and sorrow. And you realize that that's not working. And yet this morning as you are in the atmosphere of the Word of God, God wants to deliver you. In fact, I want to close with this story. Some of you know J.C. Penney. You've heard the story of this man of God who lived his life, his business, to honor God. But you may not have known this about him. During the Great Depression, J.C. Penney was hit particularly hard. It endangered his health, anxious and, anxious and desperate because of huge financial losses. He felt he had nothing to live for. This fear, this anxiety took a toll on him emotionally and even physically to the point where he was in a hospital not feeling like he was even going to live through the night. In the early morning hours, he began to hear a song coming from somewhere. And the song went like this, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. So he thought, I gotta, I gotta hear what's going on. He got up out of his bed and he walked down the hallway. He entered into the ch chapel where he continued to listen to the song. 
And then he listened to the scripture reading and the challenge from the word of God. And then he listened to the prayer. He later wrote these words. Suddenly, something happened. I can't explain it. I can only call it a miracle. I felt as if I had been instantly lifted out of the darkness of a dungeon into warm, brilliant sunlight. From that day, Penny was never again plagued with worry, worry. And he later called those moments in the chapel the most dramatic and glorious 20 minutes of his life. It was a defining moment for him. Lived to be 95, finished well served his purposes in his generation and fell asleep just like David did. What is the enemy using to intimidate you? What is the enemy using to incite fear in your heart? Is it fear of death? Is it fear of the future? Is it fear of sickness? Maybe it's fear of acceptance or rejection. Maybe it's a fear of change or a fear of failure. How is the enemy tormenting you? Because here is the scripture that I'm going to close with today that I believe speaks to where you are right now if you're living in fear. The apostle said in 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So here's what it's saying. Fear is the opposite of love. And who is love? Love is God. So whenever God comes in to your situation, whenever you open the door and say, God, you come in, the Bible tells us that fear has to go. In comes confidence. In comes courage. Leaves fear and worry and anxiety. It can't stay. So I'm declaring that over you this morning. If you have been living in fear, if you've been worried about something, if you've been troubled and anxious, today I believe is going to be a moment like J.C. Penny had, a defining moment on July 31st, 2016. God is going to break the shackle of fear off of you so that you can live and operate as a free person. So you know what? I'm going to have you be bold this morning because some of you have a fear of what people think. And you need to get to a point where you don't care what people think. You need to be like David when he was dancing before the Lord, losing his clothes. I don't care what people think. Some of you have been plagued with worry, but listen, even by you standing to your feet right now, God, I believe, is going to bring freedom to you. If that's you right now, if you've been struggling, battling anxiety, fear, maybe it's about your kids, your job, maybe it's about the economy, maybe it's about the, uh, the elections in 2016, but you'd be bold and say, you know what, I'm not going to live in fear. I just need one person to start it. I need one person to start it.